Hello friends. Well, it's Robert's birthday week and we're still celebrating. You know, I have celebrated 50 birthdays with you. Actually, the first birthday gift that I gave Robert was, do you remember when you turned 18? A calculator. A calculator. And at the time, it was an extraordinary piece of technology. I think all it did was add and subtract. And take square roots. And take square roots. But um, it cost me $100 <laughs> for a calculator back then. That was probably 1974. Right. Yeah. And we've had lots of fun birthdays since then, but most of them have involved technology. This year, I gave Robert the sun and the moon and the stars because I gave him a brand new kind of telescope and I want him to tell you all about it. So, first of all, thank you for all of the presents throughout <laughs> my life and for being my underwriter for technology. Yes. Um, what Jill gave me was something that is actually an astrophotography camera on a telescope mount. So uh, let me get the device. So here is the, here is the device. It is called a Sea Star. And as I said, it is actually a camera uh, mounted on a device. Now, um, many astronomers, including myself, use telescopes and then at some point mount an astrophotography camera in place of the lens and then take photographs of deep sky objects and the planets and then process those photos. And what this device does is it skips the telescope part and goes directly to the capturing and processing of the photos. It's um, highly automated. Most of it occurs inside the camera. Although for those of you who are astronomers out there, if you're interested, you can take the individual frames and stack them on your own. Although what this device actually does is it stacks the photos in the camera and gets incredibly distant, faint objects and creates a photo that you can then view on your iPad or your phone or your computer, which can then be enhanced. Um, the advantage to this is that instead of the 90 minutes of setting up your 11 inch Celestron telescope and calibrating on an equatorial mount to three different stars or five different stars, you press a button on this, it uh, finds itself using um, frame resolving uh, instead of any kind of uh, trigonometry. It just mounts, uh, matches frames to the sky and locks on pretty quickly to an object and it has an alt azimuth mount that shoots in only 10 second bursts because there's no cool, no fan on the camera. Um, a little bit of technical details there for astronomers uh, who are interested in this. So what I'm gonna ask Jill to do is to just film me uh, setting this up. We'll keep track of the time between turning it on locking it on to an object. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, go back inside the house and I'll probably let it track an object for about an hour, although we've had intermittent clouds. Um, one thing I, I, I want to say, in, in addition to the ease of not having to have the 90 minutes to set up your rig and w wait for objects to come into view and to calibrate, um, it's not as light sensitive as a telescope. The moon is up this evening, a full moon. We're in our backyard in Encino. I normally would not observe from my backyard, let alone with a full moon. Uh, what I'll do is I'll take an uh, image of an object uh, and then I will share it with you at the end of this video and you can see the results that you can get uh, from this device. Now, the big controversy is this isn't looking through a telescope with your own eye to capture the photons um, through the mirrors and the lenses. And so it is a different experience. 
It is, however, how most astronomy is done these days. It is, it is done by capturing photons, processing them, and then presenting them as images. That's how every image you see from the Hubble Space Telescope, from uh, the Webb uh, Space Telescope, uh, you know, and other large telescopes, they're capturing the photon data, if you will, processing it and then presenting it as the image that it catches. So I don't see this as replacing my optical telescope. I see this as something in addition to it and I'm just getting to know it, and so that's the background. All right, so I'm now going to turn the device on. You do not need an internet connection uh, to the internet in order to do this, although it has a local Wi-Fi spot. It's booting up and it will give me an audible signal. So it says that it's ready to connect. I've now located it. There's now a Wi-Fi connection between the device and my iPad. I said join. It is connecting now. And we are connected. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to a preset menu of tonight's best items. And let's say I'll pick M51, which is the pinwheel, pinwheel gallery. And you will see that the device is now going to orient itself by frame resolving. So it is looking for the object. Let me get out of its way. And you'll see there's a lot of ambient light here. So it is now going through different frames to lock onto the object. So I can see from my screen, it is identified. Object is centered. Okay, I don't know if you heard that. I can see from my screen that it's locked on to several stars. It knows that it's looking at M51, although it is completely, you can't see it. The sky is awash in light. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to. Can you see the star there at the bottom? Yeah, there's a star here at the bottom. Yeah. M51 is in here. Even though, let me show you the sky. Did you see how light the sky yeah. is? All that light pollution? Still, even though, it can see this star. Now, I'm going to say, take a picture. And what it is going to do, it is it's going to auto-level itself so that it can track the item. And so it's going through a series of calculations to ensure that it is... Um, level horizontally Finding object. so it's now recalibrating itself having leveled itself okay so it's it's um, found the object again after leveling itself it is now preparing to take the picture so um, it's enhancing the image uh, so that it can begin to track individual stars, individual pixels, if you will. And I think we're probably five minutes in from when we began. I will turn off some of the backyard lights here. They're on so we can take this video. But, you know, I can probably see 10 stars, and yet this is... Uh, locked on to M51, which I believe is about a, an eight magnitude deep sky object. But 
to say that to get to this point with your with your telescope would have taken how much time? Probably 90 minutes or so. Um, now, if you can look down at the bottom here, there's a little timer and it's taking 10 second bursts of the image uh, or of the object and it will begin stacking those. And you can see some of the stars are coming into view with a little more definition. So um, I think I'm gonna let this sit out here for an hour or so and we'll see what kind of an image we get and then we'll share it at the end of uh, this video. It's the day after the big astronomy event last night where Robert tried to capture a deep sky object. And um, he's gonna share the results with you today. P.S. It's Barbara Streisand's birthday today. Okay, so we had partial success. After I set up uh, my sea star, two things happened. Uh, the moon came over the horizon about 10 minutes after we started to take images. And then uh, secondly, about 30 or 40 minutes into the image taking, a marine layer of clouds came in and obscured the sky. So I really had about 40 minutes of sort of very bright conditions to take uh, images. And as a result, there was a high rejection rate of the, the photos of uh, the image M51 because the sky was just too bright and the, the device couldn't plate resolve by identifying stars in the area. Nonetheless, it captured, I think about two minutes and 30 seconds of images. And I uh, exported them, put them into uh, Lightroom, increased the contrast and dehazed a little bit. And he, this is the product and I'll put that into, I'll give the image to Jill so she can put it in. But as you can see, no, we're really getting a lot of reflection there. You absolutely can see the spirality of M51 and then the dwarf galaxy off to the bottom left. Um, it's a fairly noisy photo uh, because the, one, the sky was so bright and two, I'm not working with very many images. But you saw real time how long it took me to set up the device to get this image, which uh, you know otherwise would have taken hours of setup and time. So the takeaway is that C-Star has a place in an astronomer's toolkit. Um, the ease of use, the ability to just grab and go and set it up increases the likelihood that you will actually spend time outside observing. Um, I think you can uh, export individual frames and do stacking on your own if you want to do that, in which case you obviously would get a much higher quality image. So my initial impressions are that it's a great device. It's not a toy. Um, it does take a little bit of knowledge of, of uh, astronomy in order to understand how it works. But if anybody's interested, I highly recommend it. And again, it's $499, which is less expensive than many eyepieces uh, for an 11 inch reflector telescope. So it's a real bargain. Oh, but P.S. Robert, why don't you show them the image that you captured where you have more time? Sure. Um, so I, I tested it on one prior occasion and I got a longer exposure. And let me show that to you. And this is the earlier exposure that I got. You can see there's just much more, there are many more uh, photons that were picked up in, in this image. Um, and I think this was about an hour of observing time. So you can see the differences. And the sky was darker because the moon was below the horizon uh, for this photo session. Fabulous. Thanks, Robert. And thank you to Jill for my wonderful birthday present.